morning again. It's good to see you all all here today. If you have your Bibles and want to open up to the book of 1 Thessalonians, we're going to start there and then jump around to a lot of other uh, scriptures this morning as we jump between topics. Last time we were together, we talked about things. We talked about what things are. Y'all remember what things are? Thingamadoodles, thingamabobs, those things. Right, things can be anything. So we started talking about Thanksgiving things, things we should be thankful for. We talked about two things that were, uh, I believe, fairly obvious, and then one that was maybe a little bit surprising. So we said we should be thankful for small things, we should be thankful for significant things, and then the surprising thing we talked about last time was suffering things, that we should be thankful even when we suffer. Today I want to talk to you about three more things that we should be thankful for as we finish up this series on gratitude and um, the series on thanksgiving and thankfulness. And we start again in 1 Thessalonians 5, starting in verse 16, where it says, Rejoice always, pray constantly, give thanks in everything, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. If this is God's will for you, we should probably pay attention to it. Amen? He says, give thanks in everything. The big idea from last time is still our big idea today, that everything means everything. Everything means everything. We should give thanks in every single thing. So here's the first thing for today. Let's dive right in. We have a lot to cover. I believe we ought to be thankful for specific things, specific things. This is one of the things that um, I've heard the most from people who've taken time to go through the gratitude journey. I know many of you are, are just probably about halfway through it if you started it at the beginning of this month. But I've received emails from people uh, both inside of our congregation and outside of our congregation with testimonies about uh, what that little devotional or, or journal has meant to them. And one of the most common things that I've been hearing is how thankful people are for the encouragement to be specific in their thanksgiving. Because one thing that little journal makes you do is it makes you really think about all the things you're thankful for. It, it, it encourages you or entices you to be specific with your thanksgiving. You name them. You identify them. You internalize the things you're thankful for. And in doing that, over the course of eight weeks, you develop this discipline inside of yourself that, that results in some, some very outwardly positive things because you start identifying specific things in your life every single day and hopefully every hour of every day that you have to be grateful for and thankful for. It reminds us of, of all those specific things that we should be thankful for. That reminds me of one of my favorite hymns, um, Count Your Many Blessings. I know we did Little Mermaid last time, but we're going to be a little more spiritual this time, okay, as we finish this series up. How many of y'all have ever heard the hymn, uh, Count Your Many Blessings? Raise your hands. Okay, great. If you haven't heard it, man, go look it up. It is great. I am not going to sing it to you today. But uh, I am going to read the, the lyrics to it. And the reason I want to read the lyrics instead of sing is two parts. Uh, part number one is you do not want to hear me sing. Uh, God puts up with it, but you, you probably wouldn't. Um, and then number two, I, I feel like sometimes when we're singing these hymns, because we've sang them so many times, we, we, we lose the meaning behind them and the words. And when we just take time to read through the lyrics, um, sometimes they hit us a little different. And so I just, I just want to read the lyrics of this wonderful, beautiful, amazing, very familiar uh, hymn that many of us have been singing since we were children. It says this, When upon life's billows you are tempest-tossed, when you are discouraged, thinking all is lost. Anybody ever been there? Count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one, count your blessings, see what God hath done. Are you ever burdened with a load of care? Does the cross seem heavy? You are called to bear. Count your many blessings, and every doubt will fly 
and you will be singing as the days go by. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God hath done. When you look at others with their lands and gold, think that Christ has promised you his wealth untold. Count your many blessings, money cannot buy your reward in heaven, nor your home on high. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God hath done. So amid the conflict, whether great or small, do not be discouraged. God is over all. Count your many blessings. Angels will attend. Help and comfort give you to your journey's end. Count your many blessings. Name them one by one. Count your blessings. See what God hath done. It is good to be specific. When it comes to thanksgiving and gratitude, it is good to be specific when it comes to counting our many, many, many blessings. We should indeed name them one by one, if for no other reason than this, in recognition and realization of the fact that each and every one of those specific things is a gift from our Father in heaven. As you read through the Bible, it is easy, my friends, to, amidst the, the miracles and the parables and the prophecy and the poetry and the, the history and the high holiness that we encounter when we enter into God's Word and the pages of these scriptures, it is easy in the middle of all of that to overlook and to forget or just to completely fail to see that inside of these pages are many examples of the saints being specific with their thanksgiving. I want to give you just a few examples for the sake of time. If you'll look with me at the little tiny book of Philemon. This is a little one-chapter book in the New Testament. And I want you to see what Paul says here starting in verse 4. He says, I always thank my God when I mention you in my prayers. And then verse 5 begins with this word, because. He says, because I hear of your love for all the saints and the faith that you have in the Lord Jesus. I pray that your participation in the faith may become effective through knowing every good thing that is in us for the glory of Christ. For I have great joy and encouragement from your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you brother. We don't have time today to get into all the background, but this is a difficult letter. Paul is is writing to a friend on a difficult matter, a difficult subject here. And yet in the midst of that difficult conversation, in the midst of this difficult letter, what does Paul do? He gets specific about the things he is thankful for when it comes to Philemon. He wasn't generic in his thanksgiving. He wasn't general in his thanksgiving. He he didn't just cast a broad net in his thanksgiving. No, he is specific. He says he is thankful for the love Philemon has for other believers. He's thankful for the faith that he had in Christ. He's thankful for the fact that he's participating in the work of the gospel. He's thankful that Philemon loved Paul, and he knew that. He's specific in his thanksgiving in saying that he was thankful for the refreshing spirit inside of Philemon and the fact that he is using that to encourage others. Five specific things that he was thankful for. That, my friends, is counting your blessings and naming them one by one. That is being specific in your thanksgiving. Or look at the book of Ephesians in chapter 2, what Paul wrote To those believers in Ephesus, starting in verse 6, he says, He also raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavens in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might display the immeasurable riches of his grace through his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For you are saved by grace through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is God's gift, not from works, so that no one can boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. 
What a glorious picture of the gospel this text paints for us. It's why we go to it so often, I'm sure for those of you who have been in church for any amount of time or have read the New Testament any number of times, this is a scripture you recognize. It's probably one you have highlighted or have underlined or put stars and circles and squares around. It's a beautiful picture of the gospel. But you know what it also is? It's this incredible glimpse into the heart of a man who was eternally grateful and thankful for the work of the gospel. And he is specific in this text. He says he raised us up. He seated us in the heavens so that he might display the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness to us in Christ. He says we are saved by grace through faith. These are all things he is specifically grateful and thankful for. He says it's not from us or for us. It is from him and for his glory. He says it is God's gift, not from works. He concludes by saying we're his workmanship and he's grateful for that. Created for these good works and equipped for these good works. Four verses that contain at least 10 specific things Paul was thankful for, and we can all be thankful for as well. Count your blessings, name them one by one, count your blessings, see what God hath done. Be specific in your gratitude. We could look at many more examples, but we see this pattern all throughout Scripture, and we should see it all throughout the church today and all throughout our lives This is an important discipline in our lives. It's an important discipline for those who are serious about being a disciple of Jesus. When you take time to be grateful, church, here's my encouragement to you. Don't rush it. Don't get in a hurry. Don't just close your eyes at the end of the day and mumble under your breath in a half-hearted prayer. Oh, Lord, I'm thankful for today. Don't don't be broad, be specific. What are you thankful for? What did God do? How did he move? What did you see? What did you hear? How were you encouraged? How were you used? Count those blessings. Name them one by one. Because everything means everything. Here's another thing. Point number two, service things, service things. We're not always quick to be thankful for and grateful for our opportunities to be servants for the king, are we? We should be, but we're not. Two weeks ago, I was visiting with one of our church members at a 4-H meeting. It wasn't, it wasn't here at the church because that's where our 4-H club happens to meet. But uh, our kids were doing the meeting and, and Gene and I got to visit. I've known Gene for some time, but um, we've never really like had one-on-one conversation where we've kind of had time to just get to know each other. And it, it was great to just get to visit and talk. And in the course of our conversation, I found out that Gene works for an organization called Crew. And I'm very familiar with Crew because when I was in college, a man by the name of Greg came through my dorm my freshman year, first semester, and uh, Greg worked for Crew. He's a campus missionary, just like Gene is. And Greg befriended me, and we got to know each other. I was a believer at the time, and so we we hit it off pretty quick. He invited me to a Bible study, and uh, I actually went through a year-long discipleship process my freshman year with Greg and went to crew events and got involved in their organization uh, during my college years. So I was familiar with crew from, from that perspective. Um, And then I've also just been involved with Crew over the years. A number of my friends have served with Crew as campus missionaries, and Abby and I have helped to support them and and still do to this day. We have some dear friends out out west uh, in California, actually, who uh, serve there, and uh, we continue to support them as the Lord calls us to. And so I've been very familiar with this organization. One of the unique things about Crew is that if you're on staff with them, if you're a a campus missionary like Gene is, you have to raise your own support. You you don't just get a paycheck. The organization doesn't pay you. You have to go out and raise your own funding, much like 
missionaries do that serve overseas and other places. And because I've had many friends in crew over the years, going all the way back to that freshman year with Greg, where we prayed many times that God would bring support into his life so he could stay on the campus. And because Abby and I have supported personally a a number of campus missionaries with crew over the years, and because I know just as leading a church how hard it is to fundraise and, and raise money, and what a great step of faith that can be. When he said he worked for crew, I immediately said, oh man, so you have to raise your own support. And he immediately corrected me. I mean, it was like instant. He didn't say anything else. He just immediately corrected me. He said, no, I get to raise my own support. See, there's a difference in get to and got to, isn't there? There's a big difference in I get to and I got to. What a great attitude to have about something that is very hard, very difficult, and requires a lot of faith. No, I get to. He went on to talk about all the blessings that have come out of that process. He served with crew for a number of years. All the great relationships that God has built, all the faith that has been formed inside of himself and his family through the process of raising that support. But it got me to thinking, you see, many times we we start our faith journey and and we start serving in particular with a get-to attitude. I get to do this. I get to serve God. I I, I get to honor the Lord with these gifts. I, I get to do this. But at some point along the way, for many of us, not for all, but for many of us, it turns into a got to, doesn't it? Oh man, I got to. And there's a difference between get to and got to. There's a difference between I I get to go park cars this Sunday morning in the cold, drizzly rain, and I got to go park cars this Sunday morning. There's a difference between I, I get to go work in the nursery and let those little babies spit up all over me and do the thing they do in their diaper where I gotta clean it up. There's a difference between I get to do that and I got to do that. There's a difference between I get to serve as a lay pastor or an elder of this church and I've got to go to another four-hour meeting this afternoon. There's a difference between I, I get to help with this service project or I get to help with the fall festival or I gotta go help. There's a difference between I get to work with the kids on Wednesday night and the youth and the children who are the future, not only of our church, but of our world, and I have to go up to church tonight to work. See, everything means everything. And there's a difference between get to and got to. I want you to look with me at 1 Peter 4, 9 through 11, While you're turning there, let me point out a a few things. First, I want to point out that you're going to see a specific kind of service mentioned in this text. Here, the gift of service that is highlighted is, is the gift of hospitality. But the writer does expand and broaden this idea out to other gifts. He's he's using that specific gift as his point that he's trying to make, but the bigger point in the text is that this applies to all gifts. Read with me, starting in verse 9 of 1 Peter chapter 4. He says, Be hospitable to one another without complaining. Just as each one has received a gift, use it to serve others as good stewards of the very grace of God. If anyone speaks, let it be as one who speaks God's words. If anyone serves, let it be from the strength God provides, so that God may be glorified through Jesus Christ in everything. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. What a great text. There's so much we could say here, but let me just make a few key points. First... No matter what our service is, we should do it without complaining. No matter what it is God has called us to do, we should do it without grumbling. 
We should have a get-to attitude, not a got-to attitude, no matter what our service is. Next, we see that God has given us all specific gifts for the unique purpose of service. The reason you have spiritual gifts is to serve others. We're supposed to use the gifts that God gives us to serve and bless other people. We, we, we are supposed to use those gifts to serve and to bless the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords through our service to others. We should see these gifts not as personal gifts for us to hold on to and to keep for ourselves, but we're supposed to be good stewards of the very grace of God, he says, and use those gifts. When it comes to spiritual gifts from God, any gift, I want you to hear me say this, any gift you keep for yourself, any spiritual gift you suppress, any spiritual gift you hide from the world, or any spiritual gift that you just outright refuse to use, or any spiritual gift you're just too lazy to put in the effort to put it out there on the line so God can use it is a wasted gift. God has given us spiritual gifts so that we will use them to serve others, to serve Him, to serve and to grow the kingdom. And all of our service, no matter what it is, leads us to this last part of the passage. It reminds us of why we do it, why we serve, why we're grateful for the ability and the opportunity to serve, why it's a get-to, not a got-to kind of thing for us. Look at what the writer says. Again, he says, so that God may be glorified through Jesus Christ in everything. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. We should be thankful and grateful we get to serve the Lord. We should be thankful for the specific gifts that he has given us and equipped us with for our service to him and the world around us. And just in case, because I know when it comes to service, we are good at one thing, making excuses. (laughs) Just in case you think that you are too important to serve, or you're too young to serve, or you're too old to serve, or you're too new to serve, or you're too rich to serve, or you're too poor to serve, or you're too weak to serve, or you're too good to serve. Can I just remind you of what Jesus said in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, verse 45? He said, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom For many. Jesus came to serve, and we should all be committed to serving as well. And we should be thankful for the opportunity to serve. We should be grateful that the King of Kings and Lord of Lords has found us fit for service in his kingdom. Everything means everything. Just like last time we were together, I want to close with a surprising one. One maybe we rarely think of, or when we do think of it, we certainly don't think of it from a gratitude perspective. The third and final one for us today is this, stewardship things. Stewardship things. Last time we closed with suffering things. Today I want to close with stewardship things. It's not one we commonly think of when it comes to thanksgiving, but shouldn't we be thankful that just as the Lord has equipped us and called us to serve and given us a place to serve and the things we need to serve, that God has also equipped us and called us to be stewards of his kingdom? If you will, quickly, let's turn back in our Bibles to Genesis chapter 2. I want to go all the way back to the beginning, mainly because I want you to see that the Lord, from the very beginning, created us to be stewards. 
And I want you to see that this is not a money thing. I'm not fixing to talk to you about tithing 10%. I'm not going to beat you over the head about putting money in the plate or the offering can on your way out today. I want you to see this is a stewardship thing. And it's, it's bigger than a money thing. It's bigger than a tithing thing. It's not just a, a giving thing, which is what we so often make stewardship about. Look at verse 15 in Genesis chapter 2. The Lord God took the man and he placed him in the Garden of Eden to work it and watch over it. How many of you have read that verse before, heard that verse before? Okay, most of you. So Adam is created, he's called, and he is commanded by God to do two primary things from the very beginning. He is called to work the garden, and he is called to watch over the garden. Working the garden and watching the garden, can we agree? You know what working the garden and watching the garden adds up to? What the sum of those two things is? It's stewardship of the garden. God has put him from the very beginning, called him, commanded him, give, given him this, this great thing called stewardship and said, you are to work this and to watch this. And you and I are created from the same thing, right? For this same purpose. We're created to be stewards. We, we can pretend this is not true. We can ignore it. We can totally disobey God and refuse to do it, but we cannot deny that the Bible makes it clear, and the Bible is extremely consistent from Genesis to the maps and the appendixes in the back. There's great consistency in this concept of stewardship from the very beginning all the way to the end. We're called to be stewards of everything because everything means everything. We're called to be stewards of everything the Lord puts in our life, not just our wealth and our possessions. We should be good stewards of our time. We should be good stewards of our, our children. We should be good stewards of our homes. We should be good stewards of our communities. We should be good stewards of God's church. We should be good stewards of our relationships and our marriages. We should be good stewards of our material possessions. We should be good stewards of our education. We should be good stewards of our planet. We, we should be good stewards of anything the Lord has blessed us with. Anything the Lord has given you, anything the Lord has provided to you, anything the Lord has said, I want you to work this and watch this, that is what you are a steward over. You are created and called and commanded to be a steward. And we should be thankful for that. Imagine the creator of the universe trusts you. Why he would trust you, I don't know. But he trusts you and he believes in you. And he has such a great plan for your life that he made you the steward of what is his. Think about how grateful we should be for that honor. I mean, that really puts it into perspective, doesn't it? And we should be thankful for that because everything means everything. And learning to be a good steward is important. I want to read to you Proverbs 21, 20. Here's what it says. It says, precious treasure and oil are in the dwelling of a wise person, but a fool consumes them. The simple proverb really has the heart of stewardship behind it, right? That a good steward is going to live in such a way as so that they have what they need but they do not consume more than they have. This could apply to many things in our life. It could apply to money, right? The principle of debt, not being in debt because the borrower, the Bible says, is slave to the lender. You're not going to consume more than you have because that wouldn't be good stewardship. It, it could also apply to our time because many of us are so busy, it's obvious that we are overcommitted that we are underrested, and that we have spent more time than we actually have to spend. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but I bet we have all looked at our calendars or our planners or, or just our to-do list for the day and thought, there is no way I can get all this done today. 
or this week or this month. I have spent more time on paper than I actually have to spend. Because if there is one thing we are super good at doing, and I, I, hey, I'm just as guilty as anybody else. If there is one thing we are super good at doing, it's this. We can overextend ourselves and overspend ourselves in every area of our lives very, very easily. Can't we? We can do that in our marriages. We can do it in our friendships. We can do it as parents. We can do it at work, with our jobs, with our families. We can do it in our finances. The list just goes on and on and on. We are, we are super prone to overextend and overspend. And the point is this. The point is a good steward will avoid that kind of lifestyle. In Philippians chapter 1, we see a specific example of the Apostle Paul giving thanks for the good stewardship of others. He says this starting in verse 3, I give thanks to my God for every remembrance of you, always praying with joy for all of you in my every prayer because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. If you are a good steward and the Lord uses you as a partner in the ministry of the gospel, you should be thankful for that. Just as the Philippians were and just as Paul was for them. Again, it's not all related to your finances. Not all of this was related to their finances. Connecting, growing, and serving, as we talk about often here at our church, all requires stewardship of many areas of your life, much more than just your finances. And when our life is set up in a way where we seek the kingdom first and where we honor and serve the king of the kingdom above everything else, then our stewardship of all things in our life becomes evident. Paul was thankful for much more than the financial contributions that they had poured into his ministry from Philippi. He was thankful for their partnership and their participation in the ministry. They had prioritized that as people who were seeking the kingdom of God. He was grateful for their gracious stewardship of their lives, not just their wallets. I want to close with a a long passage of Scripture that's found in Matthew 25. And it's easy to get lost in these long passages of Scripture, but I think this one is extremely important for us today. Because these are words Jesus said. And if you don't think stewardship is important, because I know that's the... That's, that's the tactic the enemy likes to use. He likes to just come into your heart or your mind here and say, hey, this isn't really that, that, that important of a deal. Don't worry about it. But if you don't think it's important, if, if you don't think that God is paying attention to your stewardship, again, not just of your finances, but of your life, I want you to consider these words of Jesus very, very carefully. Matthew 25, starting in verse 19, and I'm going to read all the way through verse 30 because I want you to get the context of all of this. He says, After a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five talents approached, presented five more talents, and said, Master, you gave me five talents. See, I've earned five more. He doubled the master's money. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Share your master's joy. Verse 22, the man with two talents also approached. He said, master, you gave me two talents. See, I earned two more, also doubling his money. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Share your master's joy. The man who had received one talent also approached and said, Master, I know you. You're a harsh man, reaping where you haven't sown and gathering where you haven't scattered seed. So I was afraid, and I went off, and I hid your talent in the ground. See, you have what is yours. His master replied to him, You evil, lazy servant. If you knew that I reap where I haven't sown and gather where I haven't scattered, then you should have deposited my money with the bankers, and I would have received my money back with interest when I returned. So take the talent from him and give it to those, the one who has ten talents. 
For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have more than enough. But from the one who does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. And throw this good-for-nothing servant into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. We could say much about this passage of Scripture, but I just want to make a couple of points so we don't miss the most important thing that's here. This passage is often misused, particularly by the prosperity gospel preachers and teachers. And so I want to set some of that straight. I want you to notice something here first. I want you to notice that the master gave everyone something different to steward. Do you see that? They didn't all get the same thing. They didn't all get the same amount. But they were all given something. Some were given more, some were given less, some were in between. But the point is they all got something, but none of them got the same thing. There's a difference between the same thing and something. And it's the same for you and me, church. God has given us all something, but he hasn't given us all the same thing to watch over and to work. This is why people oftentimes say, well, why does he have more? Or why do they have more? Or, why is that easier for him? Or why did his mommy and daddy give him all of that money and my mommy and daddy gave me nothing? <laughs> Those are the wrong questions. It, it, God doesn't give us all the same thing. He gives us all something. And he's made us all stewards over the something that he has given us. Some are going to have more than others, and some are going to have less than others. And many and most of us are going to be in between those two extremes. But no matter what we have, but the fact that God gave us something is what we should be thankful for. Because everything means everything. We should be thankful for whatever it is God has given us to work and to watch and to steward. And this is where most people get this passage incredibly wrong and this principle of stewardship incredibly wrong. You see, most think that the master was upset and disappointed with that last steward because he didn't produce. Because he didn't produce a profit. Because he didn't double his money like the other people did. They, they, they focus on the reprimand of the master and they look at, at the inability of the servant to double that master's money like the previous two had done and they say, well, that's why he's mad. But that's not the point of the passage at all. This is not at all about the steward's efficiency or the steward's effectiveness. It is about the steward's effort. The master is not upset because the other two were more efficient than the third. He's not upset because the other two were more effective than the third. He is upset because the third one didn't even try. His master replied, verse 26, You evil, lazy servant, if you knew that I reap where I haven't sown and gather where I haven't scattered, then, then you should have deposited my money with the bankers. You should have done something. You should have tried. You should have, at the very least, let it earn some interest, he says. And then I would have received my money back with interest. You see, the problem is not that the servant failed to produce and make the master a prophet. The problem is he didn't even try. It's not his effectiveness or his efficiency that he's judged for. It's his effort. You see, I think this is important because when it comes to the Lord today and stewardship, many people are not even trying. They're not even attempting to be good stewards of what God has given them to work and to watch. And so church, my encouragement to you, my warning even to you is this, if you do nothing else, you better at least try. You better put your effort into it. And God will use your effort, but you have to give it to him first. Quit looking around at everybody else and go, well, of course I can't be as efficient as them, or of course I can't be as effective as them. I don't have as much as them. No, 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 no. Everybody gets something. Not everybody gets the same thing. 
but we're all called to try with whatever the something is God has given us. So let me encourage you one last time to be thankful. To be thankful that God has given you anything at all. And has said, I want you to watch this and work this and steward this. And I want you to use it for my glory. Be thankful for it. Because everything means everything. You might be tempted to say, yeah, but why should I put forth that kind of effort? I mean, that's going to be a lot of work. It's going to take a long time. It's going to take a lot of sacrifice. Well, of course it is. You might be saying, well, what has the Lord ever done for me? Well, (laughs) a lot, it turns out. Let me assure you that you can't outdo the Lord when it comes to effort. He sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for you. He sent his son Jesus to suffer and die for you. You talk about effort. He sacrificed the Lamb of God, the sinless Lamb of God, for your sins so you could be saved. Jesus gave everything he had, his life for you. He suffered and was sacrificed as a sinless lamb so you could be forgiven of your sins. That's what he's done for you. And if you haven't accepted that, and if you didn't know that, I would encourage you to call on the name of the Lord today. I would encourage you to repent and to believe and to trust God, to trust the Lord, to trust Jesus as your Lord and Savior before we close. Let's pray. If that's you and you're here this hour, can hear my voice this hour and have never called on Christ as your Lord and Savior, we invite you to do so with this short, simple prayer. Just say, Lord, it's me. I come before you as a sinner with a humble heart of repentance. I know I've sinned and fallen short, and so, Lord, I ask by faith that you would forgive me. I ask by faith that you would wash me clean and make me new. Lord, I ask by faith that you would grant me the great gift of grace. Lord, I thank you for what you did for me on the cross and for what you do for me every day. I thank you for your love and your peace and your grace. Father, as we close today, we have so much to be thankful for, so many small things and significant things and in-between things, Lord, suffering things, specific things, stewardship things, service things, and many, many other things that we have not talked about. But we know that all of those things are gifts from you. And all of those things are also gifts we are supposed to return to you as we work and watch over everything that you've given us. And Lord, I do pray that we would be effective and I do pray that we would be efficient in our efforts as your stewards. But Lord, more than anything today, I just pray that we would give you our full effort in the matter. Lord, help us. Help us to be people who aren't scared of hard things, who aren't intimidated by difficult things. Help us to be people who are motivated by your grace and your goodness and the gratitude that overflows from our hearts for all of it. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We praise you. We honor you. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.